Um, it's 12 o'clock. Let's get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in. I'm Aline Serfati. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist at Medscan Lagos, which is located in Cabo Frio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I'm also one of the coordinators of the musculoskeletal image group of Rio de Janeiro. This is going to be the first session of the MSK case presentation series, and it's focused on infection. We are glad to have several wonderful speakers who will participate in this series, bringing cases related to rheumatology, sports imaging, and tumor pseudotumor. I also want to thank my Brazilian colleagues, Silvana Mendonça and Pedro Dias, who helped me organize the sessions and Philip Tierman, who is the founder of OCAD, Hillary Humans, and Berangamini, who believed in this project and helped me make it happen, doing this partnership with our group from Rio de Janeiro. A couple of housekeeping points before we begin. If you have questions, please write it down on the chat, and at the end, the speakers will respond to them. This video will be recorded and will be uploaded on the YouTube channel of the OCAD, which is OCAD-MSK and of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. This information will be available online and on social media and will be sent out on OCAD as well as the link to the, the YouTube channel. A reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as it may contain material that is under copyright an authorized recording, recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you so much for tuning in. Please close, close your cameras and enjoy the session. I will introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Dr. Hilary Humans. She's a professor of radiology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Currently, she works at Linux Hill Radiology and Imaging Associates. She's been actively involved in several radiology societies serving on central committees. She has also authored and co-authored original research and review articles, book chapters in all aspects of musculoskeletal radiology. She's one of the administrators of OCAD, which is an international online MSK case sharing forum which has grown from fewer than 200 members to more than a thousand members during her service. She's, she's focused on efforts on expanding the role of OCAD in international outreach, bringing education, diagnostic support, and fostering collegiality among musculoskeletal radiologists around the world. With that, Hillary, please share your screen. Okay. Um... One second, sorry. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Sorry. Share screen. Now? No, Hillary. Okay, okay, we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> now, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I see yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Hillary Yeomans, a musculoskeletal radiologist from New York City. I'd like to thank Dr. Serfati for organizing this case series in collaboration with OCAD. For those of you who are unfamiliar with OCAD, it's an online international MSK case sharing forum, which was started about 17 years ago and now has. 1,030 members from around the world. So here's the case. It's a 33-year-old female with previous snorkeling injury. These are the initial radiographs from seven weeks following that injury. And follow-up radiographs at four months. And then the final radiographs at nine months following injury. So uh, here's the sequence at uh, seven weeks, 
we see that there's some rarefaction and lucency at the uh, medial uh, neck and distal shaft of the proximal hallux and some subchondral cyst-like changes at the base of the distal hallux. The joint space is preserved and there's periarticular swelling. At four months, we see subtle new marginal erosions with frank uh, erosive change at the medial distal aspect of the proximal hallux, more prominent cyst-like change at the base of the distal hallux with frank erosion of the subchondral bone. Note that the joint space remains preserved and swelling persists. And at nine months, there's a much more extensive central articular erosion at the base of the distal hallux. Um, there's uh, preserved bone mineral density and joint space and uh, either unchanged or increased swelling. 10 months after injury, uh, T1-weighted imaging demonstrates uh, uh, periarticular uh, subchondral dark uh, signal infiltrating the bone along with erosive change and synovial inflammation. Contrast enhanced images demonstrate avid enhancement of the thickened synovium and clearly demonstrate the inflamed synovium extending into the uh, erosion of the joint. So history of imaging favor which type of arthropathy? Is it primary inflammatory arthropathy, crystal-induced arthropathy, pyogenic septic arthropathy, or granulomatous arthropathy? Think about it for a second. And the best answer is granulomatous arthropathy. Primary inflammatory arthropathy, such as rheumatoid arthritis, um, would not be expected to preserve bone mineral density, and such extensive erosions wouldn't be expected uh, with preserved joint space. Crystal-induced arthropathy, such as gout, would be unusual in an otherwise healthy young female, although the radiographic features can be consistent with gout. Pyogenic septic arthritis shouldn't preserve the joint space over such a... So the details of this case are that the patient is a 33-year-old female who uh, sustained a puncture wound by a sea urchin's spine to her big toe while surfing in Sukuoka, Japan. 10 days after that injury, she was treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, but pain and swelling worsened over four months despite that treatment and antimicrobial therapy was reinstituted, but this time they included uh, not only bacterial, but also fungal and mycobacterial coverage. Despite that, her symptoms worsened and at 10 months, she underwent surgical synovectomy with debridement and arthrodesis. All surgical cultures were negative. They did not isolate acid-fast bacilli or fungi. fungi. At histology, there was necrobiotic granuloma, new bone formation in the background of granulomatous inflammation, articular cartilage degeneration, and devitalized bone, all features of granulomatous synovitis, arthropathy. Uh, sea urchin spine penetrating injuries are common, especially in the hands and feet. Immediate uh, sensitivity reaction includes pain, burning, swelling, and redness. But with capsular articular penetration, there can be delayed periarticular swelling with stiffness and pain. These are features of granulomatous synovitis. Possible mechanism may be foreign body reaction to the inorganic components of the spines, which include calcium, magnesium, carbonate, calcium, sulfate, phosphates, and silica. Mycobacterium marinum has been implicated because of the aqueous environment, but in a large series, they only isolated mycobacteria in 21%, and less than 30% were actually proven mycobacterium marinum. Treatment, again, is synovectomy and debridement, whether or not they identify uh, a retained spine. Conservative therapy with antimicrobials is ineffective and also delayed definitive treatment. There are 600 species of sea urchin primarily comprised of calcium carbonate with an epithelial covering. Uh, 
They can be solid, hollow, sharp, or blunt, and foreign proteins may bind to the epithelium, even of non-venomous spines. Patients uh, usually try to remove the spines, but they're fragile and easily break, uh, resulting in retained fragments. This commonly occurs in snorkelers and, snorkelers and scuba divers around rocks, reefs, and shallow water. They can be sharp and penetrate dive suits and boots. Hand injuries are often related to sushi harvest and preparation. Cutaneous penetration can result in granulomas and papules. Radiographs and ultrasound are used to identify and localize spines, but these can decalcify over time, though that can be variable according uh, to the variety of sea urchin and their spines. In a case uh, shared by uh, Dr. Kate Stevens, we see that the sea urchin spine in this uh, individual uh, didn't change over four months. Um, she shared another case uh, in someone who experienced mother, uh, multiple penetrating wounds, but we can only see one spine. MRI uh, was performed in the same patient and uh, was uh, relatively insensitive for detection of spines. Here we can see that there seems to be localized uh, soft tissue edema with a probable uh, central dark signal spine, but it can be difficult on MRI to differentiate spines from fibroadipose septae. Um, here we can see that same uh, spine that was visible radiographically plantar to the fourth toe. The advantage of ultrasound is it permits precise localization and you can mark the uh, skin uh, for preoperative planning. Um, in the same individual, we see two additional spines plantar to the first web space with associated uh, localized vascularity on Doppler interrogation. Actually, ultrasound in this case identified eight or nine spines, so it's the most sensitive modality for this purpose. Uh, there was one plantar to the fourth toe, which we saw. Actually, there were five plantar to the first web space and two or three plantar to the big toe. Or to the hallux. So to summarize, sea urchin spine injury is common. This is most commonly cutaneous injury and spine removal is performed to prevent granulomatous reaction. Articular penetration by sea urchin spine is rare and can cause a delayed granulomatous synovitis characterized by an erosive arthropathy with relative preservation of bone mineral density and joint space. Radiographs and ultrasound are the preferred imaging modality and they are complementary. Remember that the definitive treatment is synovectomy and debridement, which is necessary even when the spine is no longer visible. Antimicrobial therapy is ineffective and only delays definitive treatment. So with that, I'll end my presentation, uh, but uh, put in a plug for OCAD, which stands for one case a day. It's a wonderful collegial uh, international musculoskeletal case sharing forum. Um, we share interesting cases. We rely on one another for diet for diagnostic support. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. If you're interested and you want to join us or check it out, contact me. I'm Hillary Humans. My email is hillary.humans at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Um, can everybody see me? Yes, Hilary, okay. thank you very much. Beautiful case and presentation. Okay, um, moving right along, I think, is uh, Aline speaking next? Yeah. I'm going to introduce Aline. She is a practicing radiologist and medical director at Metascan Lagos. She's currently conducting doctoral research at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and she is a research scholar at New York University. She's an advisory board member 
at Medscape and also a member of several radiology societies in Brazil and a member of the International Skeletal Society. She's authored and co-authored original research and book chapters in musculoskeletal radiology. Since 2019, she's one of the coordinators of the musculoskeletal image group of Rio de Janeiro, helping bring education and partnerships among Brazilian and international radiologists. Thank you, Hilary. I'll share my screen. My name is Aline Serfari, and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist in Cabo Frio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. My case is about an 18-year-old male presenting with dyspnea, weakness, back pain, weight loss, and intermittent fever for six months. He underwent surgery to repair tetralogy of fellow in his first year of life. His physical examination was unremarkable and no motor or sensory deficits were noticed. He had a hypochromic microcytic anemia and his DSR and CRP were elevated. His HIV tested negative. His chest radiograph shows an interstitial infiltrate in the superior segment of the right inferior lung. The duration of the right costophrenic angle suggesting a right-sided pleural effusion, an enlargement of the cardiac area, and widening of the mediastinum were also visualized. MRI of the whole spine revealed a large rim-enhancing prevertebral abscess with a thin and smooth wall extending inferiorly up to the sacrum with multiple enhancing lesions in the vertebral bodies and an epidural extension in the sacral level. Axial images of the thoracic and lumbar segments of the spine show involvement of the costochondral joints and posterior elements. Facilitated diffusion in the abscess was visualized with an ADC of 2.0 together with small areas of restricted diffusion with an ADC of 0.9 reflecting a heterogeneous content. On CT, erosions of the anterior and posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies were seen, some of them extending to the pedicles. Other lytic lesions in the sacrum, ilium, pubis, and ribs were seen. Cal calcification foci within the paravertebral abscess were also observed. On chastity, there were multiple centrilobular nodules with a linear branching pattern in the upper segment of the lower right lobe. Right pleural effusion and paratracheal lymphadenopathy were also visualized. In summary, this is the 18-year-old male presenting with dyspnea, weakness, back pain, weight loss, and intermittent fever for six months. On MRI, there is a large prevertebral abscess with subligamental spreads to multiple vertebral levels. There are also enhancing lesions in multiple vertebral bodies. On CT, lytic lesions in several bones are observed. Chest X-ray and CT show parenchymal lesions and pleural effusion. With that, our differential diagnosis included infection and non-infectious diseases. However, an atypical infection like tuberculosis followed by fungal infection was considered likely based on the imaging findings. A biopsy of the lumbar vertebra was performed and bone tissue was sent for mycobacterial, fungal, and bacterial stains and cultures. Gene export was positive for mycobacterial tuberculosis. And culture of the bony fragment revealed mycobacterial tuberculosis. Around 50% of skeletal tuberculosis involves the spine. 
the lower thoracic and upper lumbar levels are most commonly affected. Little or no reactive sclerosis or local periosteal reaction are seen. MR imaging is the preferred imaging modality in the diagnosis and assessment of tuberculosis spondylitis. A DWI may show restricted diffusion or in some cases facilitated diffusion with high and low ADC levels because of a more fluid con content versus a viscous content. This is an interesting study in which the authors studied the differences between pyogenic and tuberculosis spondylitis. And they found out that a well-defined paraspinal abnormal signal, a thin and smooth abscess wall, the presence of intraosseous abscess, and the subligamental spread of more than three vertebral levels favor a diagnosis of tuberculosis. This is a companion case of a 28-year-old male patient with chronic back pain that worsened after a fight two weeks before the MRI. He was diagnosed with tuberculosis spondylodiscitis. MR images saw discitis at the L1, L2 level, along with a paraspinal abscess involving both psoas muscles, prevertebral and epidural space. He had a chest CT that shows parenchymal changes and a second MRI after abscess drainage um, that shows partially resolution of the abscess. This is a follow-up radiograph um, of the first patient two months after starting treatment that shows partial resolution of the right pleural effusion. Other interesting case kindly sent to me by Dr. Tatiana Cantarelli from Sao Paulo was about a 61-year-old female presenting with moderate sensory loss in the thoracic region. MRI shows a perivertebral mass circumferentially to the first, second, and third thoracic vertebras with bony remodeling of the posterior wall of the vertebral bodies. High signal intensity is observed in the second thoracic vertebral body, likely to enter also as extension of this lesion. Extension to the spinal canal with stenosis of the respective intervertebral foramina and compression of the spinal cord is also observed. Multiple periaortic and cervical lymph nodes were also visualized. After a gadolinium injection, there is enhancement of the mass. So putting it all together, there is a large perivertebral mass circumferentially to the first, second, and third thoracic vertebras with the extension to the spinal canal and stenosis of the respective intervertebral foramina and compression of the spinal cord in a 61-year-old female. The mass was biopsied and this was a lymphoma. Although lymphoma and tuberculosis um, in the spine may have a few similar imaging findings, such as the involvement of multiple vertebral levels, in tuberculosis spondylitis, we see a more fluid, we see more fluid collections, which are the abscess and not paravertebral mass like in lymphoma. We should think of tuberculosis spondylitis when there is um, a paraspinal or intraosseous abscess, subligamental spread to three or more vertebral levels, multiple vertebral or entire body involvement are more suggestive of tuberculosis spondylitis than pyogenic spondylitis. And the presence of calcification within the abscess is also suggestive of tuberculosis spondylitis. With that, I end my presentation, and I'd like to thank Dr. Eduardo Brown and Dr. Tatiana Cantarelli for their contribution in the pre preparation of this case. Thank you very much. Okay.
Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I will introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Benjamin Levine. So Dr. Benjamin Levine is an associate professor of radiology at the University of California. He is also uh, the director of musculoskeletal ultrasound and of the elite sports imaging program at the same institution. Please, Ben, share your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Nope. Not yet. Okay. Doesn't seem to be sharing here. Do you see the green button on the bottom? Yeah, it's it's I'm putting the button, but it's not sharing. It's not offering my desktop for some reason. Let's see. Okay. Now I can see your screen. Okay, here we go. Hello everyone. My name is Ben Levine. I am a musculoskeletal radiologist at UCLA. Ben, and we're just seeing your finder window. Not ben, we're not seeing your presentation. Okay. Your voice and midfoot pain, erythema, and swelling. No, we're, we're not, not seeing the here's presentation. Here's the sagittal T1 weighted image through the midfoot and a portion of the hind foot, but, and the corresponding sagittal fluid sensitive or stir. Okay. Um, no, we saw for just a second, and then it's okay. Hold on, let me try this again. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, let me try sharing it again. Okay. Okay. And after you do, um, maximize the image to uh, fill the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And maximize Hello, the image. Everyone. My name is Ben Levine. I am a musculoskeletal it radiologist at UCLA. And I'd like to thank Dr. Humans and Dr. Serfati for inviting me to speak it? here today. Yeah, it looks good. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Levine. I am a musculoskeletal radiologist at UCLA. And I'd like to thank Dr. Humans and Dr. Serfati for inviting me to speak here today. I'd like to show two companion cases today. The first is a 54-year-old female with diabetes and midfoot pain, erythema, and swelling. Here is the sagittal T1 weighted image through the midfoot and a portion of the hind foot and the corresponding sagittal fluid sensitive or stir image through that same area. And I'll let you take a look at that for a few seconds. Let me show you the companion case. 66 year old male with exactly the same history, diabetes, midfoot pain, erythema, and swelling. And here are the images associated with this case. Sagittal I'm just uh, seeing the images, but I can't hear. And sagittal fluid sensitive, again, through the midfoot. And I'll let you take a look at that for a few seconds. I'm sure most of you came up with the diagnosis of diabetic neuroarthropathy for both cases. But the real question here is, 
which one of these cases has superimposed osteomyelitis and which one does not, case A or case B. This is often a clinical and imaging diagnostic dilemma. And there are certain imaging features that can help us uh, decipher this and make this differentiation. Before we talk about these cases, I'd like to discuss this topic in a little more detail. With regard to diabetic pedal osteomyelitis, this invariably results from an ulcer or abscess in contiguous soft tissue structure. Ulcers, as you know, occur most commonly at the plantar aspect of the first MTP joint, plantar aspect of the fifth metatarsal head, the tip of the great toe distal phalanx, the dorsal toes, and it's important to remember that the hind foot is a less common location for ulceration, but it certainly can occur. And the midfoot is a quite uncommon location for ulceration to occur until you get to a situation where you have uh, lots of fragmentation and deformity of the midfoot in the neuroarthropathy as shown in the case on your bottom right. And you can see at that point, the patient is walking on that mid portion of the foot due to the deformity, and you can create an ulceration as shown on the image on your bottom right. But in general, midfoot ulceration is less common and uncommon actually. From a clinical perspective, the presence of an ulcer has a low positive predictive value for osteomyelitis. If you can probe ulcer to bone, however, you can raise your positive predictive value to about 89%, but the negative predictive value stays low at about 56%, meaning that failure to probe to bone does not exclude the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. And it is this diagnostic or clinical diagnostic uncertainty that makes imaging a critical adjunct test for the diagnosis, staging, and prognosis of pedal osteomyelitis. In terms of imaging, radiographs provide an important baseline examination for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. However, we know they are insensitive as the findings on x-rays such as periostitis, destruction, and erosion do lag behind the clinical findings by as much as 10 to 20 days. Having said that, x-rays are still very important to have as a baseline examination and probably first-line examination as when we're reading MRIs, it's a very nice to have the x-ray to identify you know, distal surgical amputation sites that may be harder to see on MRI or foreign bodies or soft tissue gas that may be hard to, harder to see on MRI. And certainly in cases where there is destructive neuropathic arthropathy, the x-ray is very nice to have as sort of a roadmap and guidance for reading the MRI. Now, as you know, MRI is the imaging modality of choice for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis, being about 90% sensitive and 79% specific for the diagnosis. The protocol at our institution includes the following. Uh, we like to tailor the examination to the specific patient and specifically the area of clinical concern. So the area of clinical concern will determine which planes we, uh, we favor. Uh, we I like to put markers on the area of concern, particularly if there's any ulceration or overlying cellulitis. Uh, we need to be mindful of field of view in the foot with regard to forefoot, midfoot, or hindfoot imaging. Of course, we don't want to image all of them in one field of view. And we will perform a combination of T1 weighted imaging and fluid sensitive sequences with um, reliance on inversion recovery sequences, particularly for uh, the distal aspects of the forefoot where we'll have more uniform uh, field homogeneity. In terms of IV contrast, it can be quite helpful um, in cases of osteomyelitis, particularly for uh, the soft tissue evaluation, such as you see in the case on the right where we can identify a sinus tract there, that would be very difficult to identify or more difficult to identify if we did not have um, intravenous contrast in this case, but also for soft tissue fluid collections, it can be helpful. And it can also be helpful to evaluate viability of the bone in cases of osteomyelitis. Now it's important to be aware that there are, or there have been described advanced MR imaging techniques for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis and also for the differentiation of osteomyelitis in cases of underlying neuropathic arthropathy. And some of the advanced imaging techniques that have been described include Dixon and chemical shift imaging, DWI, dynamic contrast enhancement, MR neurography and DTI, and uh, MR angiography. 
This discussion, however, is beyond the scope of uh, this short talk today, but I do want you to be aware that these advanced MR techniques have been described. Now, with regard to the diagnostic dilemma that we discussed earlier, is there superimposed osteomyelitis in cases of diabetic neuroarthropathy that we see on MRI? How can we make this distinction? How can we be confident that there is or, or there is not osteomyelitis in cases of diabetic neuroarthropathy that we see on MRI? Well, there are some MR imaging features that have been described that can help us make this diagnosis. The first is location. It is important to remember that neuropathic arthropathy most commonly affects the tarsometatarsal joints and the midfoot. In contrast to osteomyelitis, which more often occurs distal to the tarsometatarsal joints and more proximal to it in the calcaneus or the malleoli. With regard to the bone marrow changes seen in osteomyelitis and neuropathic arthropathy, in neuropathic arthropathy, the bone marrow signal changes are typically periarticular. And in osteomyelitis, those bone marrow signal changes are typically more diffuse and confluent rather than periarticular. A particular sign that has been described when trying to rule out osteomyelitis when there's underlying neuropathic arthropathy has been termed the ghost sign. The ghost sign, if you can make this diagnosis, indicates that there is superimposed infection in a case of neuropathic arthropathy. So what is the ghost sign? It is where you see the bones disappearing, quote, disappearing on T1-weighted images and on the corresponding T2 or contrast-enhanced images, that bone becomes more distinct. The thought here is that in the uninfected neuropathic arthropathy cases, the ghost sign would be absent because those bones are truly destroyed and not viable. Here's an example of a case of the ghost sign that we saw at our institution not too long ago. You can see the T1-weighted image on the image on your top right of the cuboid bone where these, the bone appears to sort of disappear or go very, very dark on T1. And on the corresponding uh, contrast enhanced image on your bottom right, that cuboid bone seems to become more distinct on the contrast enhanced images. This, the go sign, thus indicating that we, are, we should be more confident in our diagnosis of superimposed infection or osteomyelitis in this case of diabetic neuroarthropathy. Now, there are other MR features that have been described that can help in the diagnosis of osteomyelitis in cases of neuropathic arthropathy, and some of them are shown here as described nicely in this study performed back in 2006, but I think still relevant now by Mark Schweitzer and his group. In this study, they found that if you could identify that there are subchondral cysts, intraarticular bodies, or thin rim-enhancing effusions in cases of diabetic neuroarthropathy, you could be more confident that those cases were non-infected. However, if you saw sinus tracts, replacement of the overlying soft tissue fat, any fluid collections, or more extensive or confluent marrow signal abnormalities, in those cases, uh, you should be concerned more that there is superimposed osteomyelitis. Okay, so now that we've discussed some of the MR features that can help us decide whether or not there's superimposed osteomyelitis in cases of diabetic neuroarthropathy, let's go back to our companion cases and decide which one has osteomyelitis and which one does not. If you look at case A, you can see that there is diffuse and confluent bone marrow edema. There's a sinus tract there that we can identify. And there is replacement of the overlying subcutaneous fat. Let's compare that or those features with case B, where we see relative preservation there of the overlying subcutaneous fat. We can identify subchondral cystic formations around the midfoot bones. And we can see that the general bone marrow edema pattern is more periarticular than diffuse and confluent. So you've all probably made the diagnosis here, case A, 
is a case of osteomyelitis and diabetic neuroarthropathy, whereas case B is a case of diabetic neuroarthropathy, but we can be quite confident that there is no superimposed osteomyelitis. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Silvana Mendonça. She's a practicing radiologist at CDPI and at Clinica Cavalieri. She's a member of several radiology societies in Brazil and one of the coordinators of the musculoskeletal image group um, of Rio de Janeiro since 2019. She's a very active and everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay. She's a very active MSK educator, lecturing in many Brazilian radiology meetings. Silvana, please share your screen. Okay, thank you, Elini. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Silvana Mendonça. I am. Sorry. Maximize it, Silvana. Yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. My friend and colleague, Aline Serfati, for the initiative, Dr. Humans for the collaboration, and all the work to make this session possible. My case is about a six-year-old male presented to emergency department with pain and swelling of the knee over the last seven days. He related the pain to a long-running training session. He declared no relevant clinical condition other than controlled hypertension. On physical examination, he was unable to bear weight and the flexion of the knee was limited. He had low-grade fever and elevated inflammatory markers. The C serum C-reactive protein was 104 and ESR 60. The x-ray showed no significant bone finding, the joint space was preserved, and there was no calcification. On superpatellar pouch, there was moderate joint effusion, and we could also see the periarticular soft tissue edema. On MRI, PD fat set images, we can see joint effusion, some synovial thickening, and soft tissue edema around the knee. There was some mild bone marrow edema on subcortical regions, and one feature that caught our attention was this low sino intensity tissue around the origin of the popliteal tendon and inside the cruciate ligaments and or at the origin after gadolinium on T1 fat set imaging. The synovial thickening was diffused. There was some mild osteitis and the low signal intensity tissue inside the cruciate popliteal origin and medial collateral ligament was seen. We interpret this feature as tophi, synovitis, and osteitis related to an acute flare of gouty arthritis. We discussed the imaging finding with the orthopedic plantonist and asked him about serum urate levels, previous history of gout, and suggest uh, to proceed investigation with a more specific imaging method like that or ultrasound. The patient reviewed he had a previous history of gout with inadequate treatment. 
serum urate was elevated, 8.1, and DECT imaging was positive for the acid uric deposit characterized for this green oval and punctiform intraticular spots on the previous sites of the tophi that we could see on MRI. Based on the imaging finding, we could conclude the case as an acute flare of gout. The patient was hospitalized and treated with colchicine and prednisone for five days, and he presented clinical and laboratory improvement with reduction of the joint pain and swelling. Uh, 23 days after the liberation, he returned to the ER, complaining the persistent joint pain and swelling. WBC was normal as well as the serum urate, ESR was elevated, and another MRI was solicited. On the second MRI, the, we could see that the synovial was thicker and the bone marrow edema was much more diffuse and intense. There was also some corridor irregularity and little erosions. The imaging of the tophi was still present. Based on the evolution of imaging with more preeminent synovitis, and most important, with the worsening of bone marrow edema, and also from the clinical point of view, we couldn't think the case is about a simple crystal arthritis. 30 days is too long for a gout flare, is supposed to have a peak and gradually declining the pain, being self-limited and lasting for seven to 14 days on maximum. And despite the treatment, there is too much bone marrow edema on the second exam, and the patient had only initial improvement with persistent pain and limitation. So needle aspiration was performed, and on synovial fluid analysis, uric acid crystals and gram-negative diplococci were found. And on synovial culture revealed Nisea gonorrhea and the patient received a 14-day course of ceftriaxone. Our case is about concomitant septic arthritis and gout. While the association between pew arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis is well documented, septic arthritis is a rare but serious complication of gout. Since both conditions can cause inflammation, fever, joint swelling, redness, and pain, it can be difficult to distinguish one from another, and synovial aspiration may be required. At the synovial analysis, the identification of crystal alone do not include infection, and culture is imperative to reach an accurate diagnosis. As in our clinical practice, the diagnosis of gout and gout flare is made without the synovial analysis. A high index of clinical suspicion on concomitant pathologies is required to make this diagnosis. The occurrence of gonococcal and gouty arthritis in the same joint is very uncommon, with very few cases reported. The knee is the most common joint affected, followed by ankle, shoulder, and wrist. High synovial WBC and elevated CRP are common in this both conditions. But some papers show that CRP higher than 100 milligrams was predictive of concomitant septic arthritis, but with a low specificity. We can still isolate crystal uh, arthritis with higher values of CRP. On MRI, the classical finding related to gout is the presence of the tophi with cortical erosion and lack of significant bone marrow edema despite the size of the tophi. But in the context of an acute gout arthritis, the presence of inflammatory arthritis, as synovitis, and mild bone marrow edema is expected, as shown in this article with bone marrow edema present, present in all cases during gout flare. 
tophi and erosion can also be present depending on disease duration. On concomitant crystal and infection, the feature of severe bone marrow edema is the preeminent and most characteristic feature with a high sensitivity and specificity. It is defined as in this paper as bone marrow edema affecting more than 50% of the bone surface and being significant more common in concomitant osteomyelitis presented in 93% of the cases and only in eight cases of uncomplicated gout. Unfortunately, mild and severe can be little subjective. I interpret the first MRI as mild bone marrow edema expected to an gout flare, and in fact, the patient had concomitant infection. Also, we don't have the answer of how long can we expect the bone marrow edema on gouty attack, so we must be aware of the patient clinic to make this diagnosis. To conclude, crystal and septic arthritis are common causes of monoarthritis and they can be clinically indistinguishable. The presence of crystal alone cannot exclude infection and high synovial fluid, WBC, and elevated CRP are common in both conditions. A high index of clinical suspicion on concomitant pathologies is required. CRP higher than 100 milligrams can be predictive of concomitant septic arthritis and crystal arthritis. Bone marrow edema is relatively uncommon in uncomplicated gout. It can be seen mildly in the acute flare, but it's much more severe in concomitant osteomyelitis. So based on that, MRI can help diagnose superimposed bone infection in crystal arthritis. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Humans and Aline Serpati for organizing the event and Dr. Levine for sharing those beautiful cases and participating. I would like also to thank our MSK group from Rio de Janeiro Radiology Society. We started very small, but highly motivated to share cases, experience, and working together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Silvana. Thank you all. Um, I don't see any more questions here in the chat. If you have questions, please write it down on the chat. This is the time for us to answer. Do you see any questions, Silvana? No, I'm, I'm opening right now. Everybody's thanking, congratulations, excellent cases. I, I also, I, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. And um, we are looking forward to the next session, which will be held on December 11th with focus on rheumatology. So with that, if there is no more questions, I will end the session. And Thank you, everybody that tuned in and everybody that was here with us. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.